Good morning. Welcome to worship. Another day the Lord has made, an opportunity to gather in his name. Today we begin a uh, series during the Sundays in Lent, which stand in contrast to our midweek service, the midweek service during the season of Lent, uh, where we focus on the, the passion and suffering of Christ. And the Sundays uh, in Lent are intended to be little Easter's that remind us of the significance of Christ's work as we anticipate the resurrection of our Savior um, on Easter morning. We begin a, a series uh, entitled The Great Contrasts or Conflicts of Lent, looking at uh, different pictures in the Bible. Today we're going to be looking at the contrast between Adam, the one man Adam, and the one man Christ, and what Adam did and what Christ did, and see how they compare. Our gospel lesson today uh, speaks of Jesus' temptation and his fight against Satan, and certainly when we remember Adam and Eve and what happened in the Garden of Eden and Christ's work on this earth to overcome him, uh, we certainly appreciate all that the Lord Jesus has done. We'll begin our worship that's laid out for you in your, in your service folder today with the singing of the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
use the confession of sins printed in your worship folder, I invite you to stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us during this season of Lent to come before him with repentant hearts, seeking his forgiveness and his strength to turn from sin and amend our lives. As we stand at the foot of the cross and gaze at our Savior suffering for us, let us confess our sins to him. Dear Lord Jesus, it is for our sake that you suffered under the hands of the rulers and the soldiers. It is for our sake that you allowed them to nail you to the cross, even though you could have walked away. It is for our sake that God the Father laid on you the iniquity of us all. It is with repentant hearts that we fall before your cross, pleading, Lord, have mercy on us sinners. It is with humble hearts that we ask you to hear us as we confess to you. The thief on the cross asked Jesus to remember him when he came into heaven. Jesus did. The soldiers and religious leaders sinned unknowingly against Jesus, yet Jesus said, Father, forgive them. It is the same mercy and grace that Jesus now gives you. For sins known or unknown, he speaks to you, you are forgiven. For comfort and certainty that your sins no longer separate you from God, he says, you will be with me in paradise. Receive this promise of forgiveness with a heart of faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. With hearts cleansed by the blood of Jesus, let us respond with joyful praise. Lord, our strength, the battle of good and evil rages within and around us, and Satan tempts us with his deceits and empty promises. Keep us solidly grounded in your word. When we fall, forgive us and raise us up again. Restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. First lesson for this morning, the first Sunday in Lent, selected verses from Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3 where we see God's perfect world ruined by sin and sin that now still affects us all. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the true fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is the word of the Lord. I invite us to sing together the psalm of the day, Psalm 130, found on page 114 in the front of Christian worship. Jesus encounters Satan head on, Satan tempting him three times and three times the Lord answering his temptation with the word of God. Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. This is the word of the Lord. Continue with the next hymn, hymn number 396.
this opportunity to gather around your word to be encouraged in what you have done for us. As we reflect on the one man, Adam, and the effects of his action, may we marvel at the actions of the one man, Christ, and the effects of his action. Bless the hearing and the preaching of your word. Amen. I invite you to take out your Bibles and open up to Romans chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 12 through 19. And also your green insert has the message notes by which to follow. I'm going to ask my tech guys to help me get my clicker working. Sometimes if you unplug the little receiver in the computer, reset it. Or All right. See if you can follow me. (laughs) May God's grace and his mercy and his peace be with us this morning as we meditate on his word. In the early 1900s, the race was on to provide a steamship that would carry passengers across the Atlantic from England to New York. You all know the story of the Titanic The builders being very confident of the size of their ship and the ability to make that transatlantic voyage in record time. Legend has it that on April 14, 1912, the builder Bruce Ismay spoke with the captain Edward Smith and told him to increase the speed and to push the ship to its limit to make it across the Atlantic in record time, figuring that any obstacle that was in the way could be easily avoided. Well, we all know the rest of the story. That what the builder of the ship thought was impossible happened. And the ship carrying hundreds of passengers was not able to avoid the iceberg. And the actions of that owner and the captain cost the lives of 1,522 people. You look at a story like this and say that's tragedy, that's unfair. But maybe looking at a story like this helps us understand that the actions of one individual can affect many. The actions of one individual can affect many. As we look at Romans chapter 5 and the two individuals that are mentioned there, Adam and Christ, I want you to keep that truth in the back of your mind and ask yourself how the actions of this one individual affect the many. I invite you to follow along in your Bibles with me as we read Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 19. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. 
But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The action of one individual affecting the many. Something that you've probably experienced in your life, in your workplace. If you fail to do a job, you affect the teammates around you. If you're part of a sports team and you miss cure few and aren't able to play, the rest of the team suffers. The election that is coming up, to who will be the next president of the United States, will affect our generation and generations to come. It's sometimes deemed when we look at this portion of scripture, that it's not fair. It's not fair that I should be suffering under the effects of Adam and what he did. But the reality is, is the effects of the actions of one man have affected the many. And so as we look at the person of Adam, our response might be, thanks a lot, Adam. Well, what did he do? Simply put, he brought sin into the world. A simple enough statement, but as we read through the Apostle Paul and his letters, especially Romans, it's probably one of those portions of Scripture you take a double take and say, what did you just say? And so let's try and sort out the effects of the one man, Adam, as they relate also to us today. First of all, we understand that Adam, who brought sin in this world, maybe just simply, first of all, brought the first experience of sin into the world. Prior to this, it was a perfect creation. There had been no sin. And maybe before we move much farther, a definition of sin might be in order. The one I'm going to work with is missing the mark. Like a target, a bullseye, if you're shooting arrows at it or practicing with your shotgun... If I miss the mark, that is rightly called sin. Not if you're practicing with your gun, but you get the point. So what was the mark that Adam had and Eve had to aim at? Just one, right? From all the trees in the garden, you are free to eat. But the tree in the middle, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, keep your hands off, don't eat it. And that afternoon... Satan, taking on the form of a serpent, came to Adam and Eve, Eve first, letting them see that the fruit was appealing to the eye as the other trees in the garden were, and said, did God really say? And isn't that the old, age-old temptation? If Satan can get us to doubt God's word, we are more apt to miss the mark. If we don't care about what God says, or have it convoluted or twisted, we are more apt to sin. So Adam and Eve, by their action, Adam taking the blame, getting the blame for all time, brought the world its first experience with missing the mark, with sin. Secondly, the reality of this sin that Adam brought into the world was that it was going to affect, infect, and affect the rest of humankind. Sin was here to stay. Adam couldn't go to God and say, oh, I'm sorry, just pretend like it never happened. God could have certainly said, that's it, Adam and Eve, you're done, I'm going to start over. But the reality was, sin was now part of the world. 
And it's interesting as you look a few chapters later than chapter 3 of Genesis, Genesis chapter 5, as it starts to recount the genealogy of Adam and his descendants. If you remember when God created Adam and Eve, it said they were made in the image of God. But a noticeable contrast in Genesis chapter 5 verse 3 says when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. Something changed. The New Testament helps us understand that this image of God was that perfect state, the righteousness that God had created Adam and Eve with, that now was lost. And so Seth and all the other children born of Adam and Eve did not inherit the perfect image of God, but rather the imperfect image of their father and mother. And this is true down the line. Sorry to say it, mom and dads. You have passed on sin to your children. It's made evident by the psalm writer, as he said in Psalm chapter 50, verse 15, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Since we were little in the womb of our mom, we already were, had the reality that we were called sinners. Not saints, not in a right standing with God, but sinners. Thanks a lot, Adam. And probably the third way that the effects of sin as it came into the world, that Adam, as he brought sin into the world, also brought the consequences of sin. Right away, we see the shame. Adam and Eve realized that they were naked, something they didn't have a problem with. But now they were ashamed. We see soon after that the blaming game. Adam said, it wasn't me, Lord. It was the wife you gave me. It's all her fault. When approaching Eve, Eve said, it wasn't my fault. It was the serpent. He deceived me. And what follows, the Lord God gives curses to the serpent, to the man, to the woman, and eventually separated them from the tree of life. Really an act of mercy that Adam and Eve would not live forever in a state of sin by eating of the tree of life. But we see that separation from God. And as we look at the reality of that which God had created to intend to live in a perfect relationship with him for and eternity now would end in death. The actions of Adam and Eve, what they deserved, as Paul wrote to the Romans, for the wages of sin is death. As you glance at the verses that the Apostle Paul records here in chapter 5, just glance through here a minute with me as your Bibles are open. First of all, verse 12. The result, the consequence of sin, in this way death came to all men because all sin. The fact that people die physically and also face eternal death. Thanks a lot, Adam. Verse 16, the judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. You may say, well, that's a little bit tough. It was just one mistake, but it was no longer perfect. And God's judgment followed. Verse 18, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men. So not just for Adam and Eve, but now all stand under the condemnation of God by nature. Not in a right standing with him. And verse 19, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. Thanks a lot, Adam. In many ways you could say, well, that's, that's not fair. But the premise holds true. The action of one affects the many. Just as the fate was sealed when that decision was made to increase the speed of the Titanic and it struck the iceberg, so our fate was sealed many years ago when Adam and Eve participated in the first sin. When you look at this condition by nature, and then we add to that the reality that we too miss the mark, knowing what the mark is that God has given to us. 
You might say, well, what's, what's the answer? How do we overcome the effects of this one man, Adam? Well, if we start looking to ourselves, we'll never win the battle. For we always will fall on the side of Adam, perpetuating sin one generation to the next. We need one that would break the mold. And that one that stands in contrast to Adam is the one Jesus Christ. The one that we can not just say thanks a lot in a sarcastic tone, but truly say thank you, Jesus. Why? Because he is the one who overcame sin in the world. An easy enough statement to roll off our lips but maybe one we want to explore a little more to understand, well, what did this one man, God man, Jesus Christ, really do? First of all, he was condemned, so I would be justified. A couple big words in there. But you look to Adam and Eve and say, well, we might say that, that was fair of God to act in that way, for he got what his deeds deserved. Right? You do the crime, you do the time. And certainly we can't look at God and say, well, you never told them or they didn't know better, any better. They knew. And they went against God's command. And the judgment that followed was certainly God's prerogative to mete out. But when we look, look at the Lord Jesus, even the thief on the cross next to him as he hung there said, this, we, we're suffering for what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. How true is that? That the Lord Jesus lived by that perfect standard that God had given and by all accounts and purposes shouldn't have fallen under the judgment of God. But the reality is the judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. That instead of me being condemned for my sin, God condemned Jesus. For my sin. That I might be justified. And that's a word that we, we throw around in church talk and church lingo. Well, what, is, what does that mean, to be justified? A phrase I like to use with a confirmation student, you probably heard me say it too, just as if I've never sinned. What does that mean? Does that mean God takes the sin and wipes it on, sweeps it under the rug and says, I'll, I'll just ignore it? No, God knows full well the account of sin that is in our lives and the times that we've broken his standard and missed the mark. But instead, God, even though all the evidence is the almighty judge and we're standing before him, the evidence piled up saying every, every reasonable judge would say you are guilty. But instead, God says you are not guilty. Declares us just, right not of our own volition and our own actions because the sin was condemned in Christ. So that God has declared us not guilty through the act of the one man, Jesus Christ. Secondly, he died so I could live. Satan deceived Adam and Eve and said, you will not surely die. In fact, God's trying to hide something from you. You will have knowledge of good and evil. Well, certainly they did. That was kind of a half-truth that became reality. Now they experienced evil. But now they were also going to experience death. The reality that came is the condemnation for sin had to be taken care of. Not just physical death, but eternal death. Paul wrote to, in, in this section again, by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man. Ever since Adam, Paul says whether they had the written law or not, whether they knew the standard or not, death has reigned in people until today. People die, with one exception. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus promised to Mary and Martha at the death of their, son, their brother Lazarus, so if you believe in me, the one who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. 
That was just a wordy promise to begin with. But then when Jesus arose after his death on the cross, now that promise became reality. That no longer did death reign, but now life did. The result of the sin of Adam that has affected us all would be overcome by the one who now lives, the one man, Jesus Christ. And third, he was made a sinner so I could be righteous. Paul wrote, through the disobedience of the one man, we were made sinners, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Another big term, what does that mean? Rightness, perfection, the right adherence to the law. So what happens? I like to call the next verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the great exchange. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What did God do in Christ? Took my sin, put it on Christ. Now Christ was treated as a sinner, even though he had no sin of himself. And now the righteousness, that rightness, that perfection that Christ had, had lived and earned himself is transferred to my account. So that no longer do I stand condemned. No longer do I face eternal death. No longer as am I treated as a sinner. But the Lord laid on him the sin of us all, the iniquity of us all, Isaiah said. And instead, God took his rightness and credits it to your account. So when God looks at you, he no longer sees us as Adam made us, but as Christ has declared us not guilty. This God did for the world. Paul wrote again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, just prior to the verse I read, all this is from God who reconciled us, restored that relationship to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against him. You see, the reality of what Christ did is for the world. There is no exception. It's not like Christ said, okay, the first 144,000 that tap into me are good to go. The rest, no. He doesn't raise that and say, okay, I'll be generous, a million five. He doesn't put a number limit on it. He simply says, the world, all time, Adam, Eve, from you, whoever follows, my work is for you. This is the effect of the one man to the world. But then maybe the natural question that follows is, will all be saved? Or who will receive the benefit of this reality? Well, as God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that is the objective truth. Objectively, term objective justification. God did this for all. So that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Faith is what makes the objective reality done in Christ mine personally, or the phrase is sometimes used, the subjective justification. That which God did for the world is applied to me personally. And that connection is also a gift. It says you are saved not because of your work and what you have done, but because of the work of the one man, Jesus Christ. You by nature follow in the path of the one man, Adam, and should be suffering under the effects of his work. But rather, God in his grace has applied the work of Christ to your account. Thank you, Jesus. For you have provided the lifeboat that has saved us from eternal disaster and death. Therein lies the contrast. Sin, death, condemnation. Thanks a lot, Adam. Righteousness, eternal salvation, eternal life. Thank you, Jesus, for overcoming sin and bringing us life for saving us. The action of the one certainly benefit the many. Amen.
May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard and keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus, now and to eternity. Amen. In response to the word that we've heard, I invite us to make confession of our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 6 of your worship folder. I invite you to stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. on our friendship registers and invite all to make note of their time with us today. And then we'll be gathering our offering to share the message of Jesus locally and around the world. I invite you to turn to page 125 in the front part of your hymnal. We'll use together the responsive prayer for the season of Lent. Please stand. Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the Gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the cost. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom, missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By the Spirit of the Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict in personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of, the, of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord. And in your mercy, be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in doing good. 
Lord, this morning we come to you on behalf of brothers in the faith and ask you to provide your presence and healing according to your will. For former district president, Reverend Walt Beckman, we praise you for the hand of healing that has allowed him to recover, begin his recovery from his bypass surgery, continue to strengthen his body as well as his faith. In this time of weakness, may he find strength in you. For our brother, Jonathan Boilio, son of Phil and Vicki Boilio, who teach at St. Mark's in Green Bay, we thank you for preserving his life. We ask you that you would give the doctors and all who attend him insight into his condition and its causes that he might be healed. We thank you for the faith you have given him and his parents to rely on you in this trying time. We also, th also thank you for the life that you have given to Martin Heisel, uncle of Judy Heikila, who now this morning enjoys the glories of heaven after suffering under an infection, sepsis, sepsis in his bloodstream. We thank you for your gift of eternal life and for overcoming the effects of sin that came through the one man, Adam, that now he is enjoying the effects of the work done by the one man, Jesus Christ. We ask that you'd be with all those who mourn his loss, hold before them the promise of your resurrection, that death does no longer reign, but rather life in you. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death that we might receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. close of hymn 455.
You may be seated. And welcome to all, especially those who are visiting with us today. We're glad you're with us. Those that may have tuned in this morning, glad you joined us. You have the schedule and announcements for your week printed on the back couple pages of your worship folder. A couple things to highlight in the week coming up. First of all, tonight we invite you all to come back and be part of our monthly praise night and ice cream social at uh, 6.30. We moved it up uh, half an hour from the ones that we had previously, so just make note of that and uh, come back and join us. Then another worship opportunity, Wednesday night at 7. We continue our midweek Lenten um, services and the dinner beforehand. And I'm not sure, usually there's a sign-up sheet. Um, Michelle Strack is coordinating that. If if there are those that... Christy, do you know if there's a sign-up sheet for... I don't know if there's one. Anyway, if you're intending to come, maybe just send the, uh, Michelle Strack an email and uh, let her know. Or look for an email probably coming later this week and respond to that. Then if you glance to the other side, just some of the other announcements to highlight. Um, those... Um, any of you know Lynn Sarver, and uh, she'll be, she's been up at, at Cape Cod these last few uh, days, weeks, I guess, and she'll be coming back uh, midweek. And then her plan is to uh, pack up her things this coming weekend, and then, uh, God willing, that closing on the house will take place, I think, about the 26th. And uh, so anyway, um, I don't know all the details as far as packing times this Friday and Saturday, but if you are available at times during that day and would be willing to help out, um, just let me know either verbally or via email, and then I will communicate with you when the exact times uh, will be. Those of you that are um, looking to build up your personal library, our publishing house, Northwestern, has a stock up sale. There's a lot of books, devotional books, et cetera, that are on sale. You might um, cruise over to their website, which I see I, I didn't put there, but if you just put nph.net, or I'll send it out again via email and with a link, and um, good Christian publications that um, I don't know which ones are all on sale, but you might just peruse uh, their selection. And then if uh, you would desire to participate in bringing an Easter lily for Easter Day, um, please make that known to Sarah Englander uh, before you leave today. Next week in our adult Bible study, we start a new series uh, under the general theme, Prepared to Answer, but looking at um, different questions that people raise in regard to the Christian faith and looking at uh, ways to answer those, and specifically answers that might come to us in the story of the Passion as Jesus um, went through that, that week of his life. Under the theme next week, we'll discuss, Why Doesn't God Answer My Prayers? And uh, so we invite you to, to join us for that. That's all I have to... Anybody else have something that needs to be announced to the group today? May God bless your day and God bless your week.